arrangement of transparency and we have institutional arrangement also of documentation of things, then I think we would be one of the major challenges for the media in the changing nature of political discourse and conflict would be taken care of. Thank you. Ms. Karman from Sri Lanka. Um, currently, Karman teaches English <coughs> at the University of Fairer uh, in Sri Lanka. Um, okay, as you can see, uh, the title is Reproducing the Traditions of Production, the Fourth Estate and Conflict uh, in the case of Sri Lanka. I'm using the word Fourth Estate and I, people before had used the Fourth Year and all that. Now, uh, I don't think uh, it's news to anybody in this gathering that uh, Sri Lanka is at a polit political crossroads of uh, sorts right now uh, in the immediate aftermath uh, of the civil war uh, that just concluded in May 2009. Uh, and, and in this political crossroads, I think Sri Lanka has a choice, I think, uh, uh, going down the path of further authoritarianism uh, through the process of militarization, uh, or uh, on, and on the other hand, the path of democratization through uh, uh, expansion in the spaces of uh, democratic thinking and action. Uh, but of course, right now, it looks as if Sri Lanka is uh, going down the former path that is further authoritarianism through the process of militarization uh, because of course of the way the war ended with victory to one party. Uh, however, I think this is where the media has a role to play uh, in leveraging society uh, in directions that will promote socially transformative thinking and action. Uh, of course, some people in this gathering may not agree that that is the role of the media, but nevertheless that is something I believe that media can play that role in leveraging society in uh, positive directions. So my question actually is, sorry. Right, my question uh, is, has the media seized upon or is it ready to seize upon the socially transformative potential afforded by the present historical moment and that is the immediate post civil war moment in Sri Lanka, where I think we can take stock and decide uh, in which direction we need to move. Now, um, having said that, English newspaper, this was the headline to accompany the story about the murder. Uh, you can see there's no reference to caste uh, in, the, in the headline, uh, nor in the, in the full article, full one page uh, article uh, on the subject. So only one newspaper, perhaps falling under the category of alternative media, actually uh, cited the, the likely cause of caste. Now, according to this newspaper, the doctor, as well as the majority of the villagers in this town, or people in this town, belong to a depressed caste, <coughs> caste from which very few people actually make it up the social and economic ladder of success, right? So they were kind of, they thought that when the police actually took time to uncover the, the murderer, that it was actually yet another, uh, you know, uh, uh, an indicator of caste-based discrimination. Uh, and that was the reason that it happened. Uh, now, so uh, caste is, uh, is, has been around uh, among the Sinhalese, you know, throughout this period, and also making a resurgence in the Tamil-dominated uh, North and East uh, at the end of the war, right? So I don't think we can sort of ignore that caste. It, we might as well actually. Uh, so I, I, my question is, why doesn't uh, the media recognize the insidious operation of caste in social relations? Uh, because one cannot work, uh, sort of wish, wish caste away uh, by not talking about it. Uh, okay, so let me move on to uh, <clears throat> the print media on the woman question. Now, unlike caste, gender is not at all a taboo topic, uh, you know, on the uh, uh, on the social and political canvas of Sri Lanka. So, therefore, the question is actually not so much on whether the media provides space for the discussion of gender issues, but how they do it. So, the media is actually not hostile to highlighting uh, women as victims of particular social and uh, economic processes, but the media has difficulty processing, I would say, the discourse uh, on women's rights uh, as seen from the kinds of cartoons that make their appearance every Women's Day, International Women's Day on March 8th. Uh, you know, uh, and just one example is this, you know, some that I actually caught. You can see that. 
Nairobi really takes one of course sort of shows this dichotomy between the upper class, uh, the women who are the activists, women who activists and feminists, and of course the the gap between them and uh, the second class you know, on that side, uh, you know. Uh, so uh, and there was one editorial uh, not too long ago, a single uh, mainstream newspaper editorial, they actually talked about uh, women's activists as uh, alcohol guzzling lesbians or something. So, uh, so in this sense, the media actually confirms this popular perception of feminism as a Western import, uh, you know, of no relevance to Sri Lanka. Um, so now this is uh, so, so also the case in this media coverage in the in recent times of this <coughs> Greece Devil phenomenon. Now, for the people who don't know what uh, the Greece Devil is all about, now the, the Greece Devil refers to this tried and tested modality that was adopted by male robbers uh, in Sri Lanka to make themselves hard to catch and difficult to see. Okay, they daub themselves all over with Greece so they can't be seen. But over the last uh, uh, three months uh, this year. Uh, this uh, this uh, Greece Devil became this ubiquitous uh, sort of uh, uh, the occasional Greece Devil became like a ubiquitous kind of phenomenon uh, to uh, appearing to all women of all Sri Lankan communities in Sri Lanka uh, and uh, you know irrespective of ethnicity, caste, class, uh, you know religion, whatever. However, what was interesting was that uh, how different communities interpreted the phenomenon of the Greece Devil uh, in the case of uh, uh, especially uh, women of the state. Tamil community, uh, it was seen as a class, uh, you know, difference. Where actually two uh, vendors who had actually returned to collect their dues uh, or debts uh, at uh, at uh, pay pay time or whatever uh, payday uh, were actually murdered by by the community uh, or whatever because they were seen as Greece devils. Now, what is even more interesting is how the Greece devil was interpreted among the Sri Lankan Tamils uh, in the north and east, where actually the Greece devil. Uh, was actually seen as coming from the military camps because in the north and east where it was the theatre of war there are a lot of uh, military camps and the military of course is seen as identified with the single Buddhist uh, majority and the manifestation of single Buddhist uh, hegemony uh, and uh, this Greece devil was seen as coming out of the camps and, and being given refuge in the military camps and it led to tensions and as a result of which uh, a policeman was murdered uh, by, by, by one segment uh, and also some people were arrested and it led to widespread discontent with the police, uh, sorry, the Tamil political parties becoming involved and all that. Now what I'm interested of course in is how the media portrayed uh, this Greece Devil phenomenon. Now to the mainstream single and English media, uh, you know the phenomenon of the Greece Devil was largely from the point of view of this immediate news value and the kind of the sensationalism uh, and there will be no attempt to probe the reasons why women of all communities cited the Greece Devil uh, at around the same time and also why the Greece Devil took on different incarnations and manifestations depending on the particular social economic uh, you know um, uh, affiliations uh, of a particular community uh, you know uh, and uh, one may ask whether it's not the function of the media to analyze but to just to report, I don't know, but you know this is something that actually has has uh, been very interesting as far as uh, I was concerned. Now let me kind of quickly move on to media and the LGBTQT identity that is lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, transgender identity. Now same-sex relationships, of course, are not only discursively taboo uh, in Sri Lanka, but also criminal in Sri Lanka under the obscenity law of the Penal Code. So we need to ask therefore whether the media actually promotes the right to non-discrimination and recognition of LGBTQT persons as equal citizens of the country or whether the media actually replicates existing structures of inequality and invisibility when it comes to uh, members of this uh, particular community because it is a fact that there are LGBTQT persons in Sri Lanka as well as in other parts of the world. Now, uh, let me merely cite two instances that places the LGBTQT person as equal human being under erasure. Uh, now, the first actually relates to a letter uh, to the editor uh, of a mainstream English news newspaper which uses the occasion of a lesbian conference which was going to be held in Colombo uh, to paint the lesbians as uh, deviants and demons deserving of violence, right? This is a letter to a newspaper by the early reader of the newspaper. Now, when this letter is published, in the newspaper, a local gay rights organization actually protests to the press council. 
uh, against the, this incitement to violence uh, against uh, lesbians by actually publishing the newspaper, uh, the letter in the newspaper. What is interesting, of course, is the response or the ruling of the press council because the press council rules against the organization uh, declaring that lesbianism was indeed an act of sadism. Right? And therefore, the, this was, it, it was perfectly correct. Uh, to have published that letter. Now you can see the, the first letter written by the uh, this uh, this uh, reader to the newspaper where at least, I don't know if you can see very well, but it's talk, calling the lesbian Jezebel and the people who don't know the, the, the good thing that is heterosexual you know, orientation uh, and saying that they should be raped and then they'll know, discover what is right and all that. Uh, that is the first letter. And the second one, of course, uh, is the press ruling which is being reported, which actually says that they are saying this is an act of sedition and therefore the letter is perfectly okay, right? So that is uh, just uh, one uh, one uh, example. My other example actually relates to an instance of hypervisibility, uh, where the Sunday edition of a mainstream single newspaper devotes its entire center fold to a story of a biologically female person who had actually married another woman under false pretext. Okay? Now, my question is, what is the newspaper's motive in highlighting the, the existence of this LGBTQT person? Now, is it to, uh, to draw attention to their presence uh, in our midst uh, and therefore to challenge uh, the heteronormativity of the London society? Or is it to consign the LGBTQT persons to further marginalization and invisibility? Right? Because it could be either. Uh, now, it appears uh, that uh, it is the latter if we consider the following, and that is that first of all the title uh, to this full page article, centerfold article, calls it the strange story of a woman who disguised herself as a man, as a man, right? And then there are the pictures of this person uh, in her before and after appearance, and before apprehension, when she appears in male, uh, this person appears in male. Uh, costume and then after she was apprehended by the police and produced in court and she is forcibly put into female attire, right? So both these photographs are reproduced in the newspaper and uh, then there's a long interview with which the uh, with which the uh, article ends in which they actually talk to a male psycho psycho psychoanalyst or psychiatrist who of course claims that uh, this is actually her processing is actually a sign of mental illness. And therefore, she deserves of pity and cure, diagnosis and cure, uh, etc. Right? And the, this uh, the LGBTQT person, who is the focus of the story, never ever speaks. Right? So uh, you can see the two two pictures just to show where. I mean, to me, even the reproducing these pair, these pictures uh, is a way of replicating. I think the the heterosexual sort of. Uh, um, uh, the, the, the orientation, uh, heteronormative orientation of the state, uh, you know, who actually wish to uh, apprehend and diagnose and cure. So it is on the whole, I think this article is actually a really salacious sort of a portrayal, right, you know, to, to sensationalism, the curiosity rather than trying to actually draw attention to the fact that, that this community is there in our midst and we have to uh, <coughs> recognize their presence. Okay, so conclusion uh, and what is the way forward, uh, I, I guess. Now, since this gathering actually attempts to interrogate the role of media in conflict situations, I thought I would like to propose in conclusion that the media should not underestimate uh, its role as the fourth estate uh, and the opportunity that it gives the, uh, the media to promote intergroup equality beyond the single Buddhist upper caste heterosexual male norm. Uh, in, the, in the case of Sri Lanka, that's quite a mouthful, but I try to get everything in. And note, note that the constitution, of course, guarantees that non-discrimination on the basis of caste, class, gender, region, uh, religion, etc., but definitely not sexual orientation, right? 